Well, we're starting a new series today, and it's been a little subtle around here as to what that series is going to be. Do you know what it is? Take a look at your program at the front, the cover. Almost everything that you've been seeing around here has to do with a series called AD. It's 12 weeks. It begins tonight on NBC at 9 o'clock. Yes, I am promoting a secular television network. They are promoting us, and if they're promoting us, I'm going to promote them. So we have a trailer this morning I want you to see, to, if you haven't already seen the multitude of advertisements that they have done about this. And uh, I want you to take a look at this, and uh, hopefully you will schedule yourself tonight and each Sunday night at 9 to watch it. And if not, uh, set your uh, DVR to uh, copy it. Sanhedrin is able to manage its people. He threatened everything these people believe in. I've betrayed innocent blood. Judas! He was a magician from Galilee. He needed to be silenced. <laughs> the Nazarene preached insurrection against all authority. How can I tell my child I love her and then leave? Jerusalem is a dangerous place. <laughs> She watched him being tortured and killed. Ah! <laughs> Can you not wait? If they find you, will they kill you? Ah! I don't know. A shadow Your leader had a great following. The authorities murdered him. Never knew it can be so cold. Fire underneath my skin. They won't stop with him. Join us. We are fishermen, not fighters. You are disciples of the Nazarene. We are. Once the Romans realize your message remains a threat, they will root you out. Live by the sword and you die by the sword. This Jesus cult grows stronger by the hour with the sole aim of challenging us all. You think he's coming back? I know he is. Did you or did you not lie to me? The Nazarene will rise from death. They are agreed on what is necessary. He deserves to die! Hi, priest. The tomb is now open and the Nazarene is gone. So what A.D. is covering is the first 10 chapters of the book of Acts, the beginning of the church, beginning with the, pers uh, the uh, crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and then moving through the founding of the church and all the trials and tribulations that they went through with doing that. What we're going to give to you today, we have a gift for each family today. It's a little guidebook that will take you through that series each week. And whether you're going to be here um, on Sundays when we go over it or not, whether you're just visiting here and you're not even living in the area, 
you're welcome to have one of these gifts and take it home. What we want you to do is to really get into the series. And what happened three years ago, I believe it was, when this group came out with this on NBC, the first one called The Bible, is all these non-church people were watching it and talking about it. And I wasn't prepared for it. I what didn't have television, so I wasn't paying attention to it and so forth. And then somebody gave me the DVD afterwards when it was over, and I started showing it to my youth group, and they were just gripped by it, and we were able to have um, discussions each week about it. So my hope is that you'll meet people who are watching this, and this will be a topic of conversation in the, um, in the weeks to come. And then if you would like a discussion group here to discuss what you saw the Sunday before, we have one at 9 o'clock here uh, each um, Sunday, and then our sermons are going to be somewhat based on the, what you watched the week before. So it'll be a lot of fun. I hope you'll get a, um, be a part of all of this. Now, for just a few minutes that we have together, I want to talk about the resurrection. Now let me throw out a thought question, a horrible thought question. Do you believe it's possible that if our president was assassinated, that he could be raised from the dead and returned to power. Now, I'm old enough to have lived through the assassination of John Kennedy. Okay, I was in first grade when it happened, all right? Many of you here can't believe I'm that old, right? Or you think, yeah, you were, you were the same age as him. And I'd have to say that a resurrection is highly unlikely, just highly unlikely. But now, that puts you in the place where the early disciples were when their leader was killed. They're shocked that it happened. No, we can't. He's 33. How can this happen? How could they have done this? And then they are even more shocked when they discover the empty tomb and that he's resurrected. The resurrection is really hard to believe in. And whether you're living now or whether you were living then, it is really something hard. So in churches today, there are going to be those who believe in the resurrection. I'm going to say, yeah, yeah, I, I believe in the resurrection. And if I was to take a poll today of how many of you believe in the resurrection, I suspect that most of your hands would go up. May, I doubt that all of your hands would go up because some of you are thinking about your lunch this afternoon. But most of your hands would go up. I believe in the resurrection. And yet, you've got all of these problems in your life. And you keep bringing these problems to the Lord, and he doesn't seem to hear you. And you think, hey, if... if he can't even take care of my problems, like my little things. How can I believe that he can actually resurrect somebody from the dead like that? And I, I know that there are some that are thinking like that. I'll tell you why. Because that's how I think a lot of times. And I'm a pastor, and I'm not supposed to think like that, am I? You don't pay me to think like that, do you? You pay me to think, oh, he can resurrect anything and do anything. Yes, I believe that but we all have those times. I want us to think about why God allowed Jesus to die so that he could be resurrected. What's the purpose there? Scripture says it was to make us new, to give us a new start. Have you ever mucked up things so badly, just messed them up so badly that you wanted to redo? Have you ever done that? Have you ever written an email so nasty that, you know, if this thing got loose, if anybody read this thing, you'd be in big trouble? Have you ever done that? And then you went, delete? Oh, thank you. Was that delete or was that enter? It's, a, it's our great fear. If only we could take back those things that we've said and we've done. If only we could get a fresh start. If only we could press delete and all those things could be behind us. Well, that's what God did with the resurrection. And that's why I believe in the providence of God, we celebrate Easter when? 
in the fall during the harvest festival, in the summer during the heat of the summer, in the winter, in the dead of winter with all the leaves gone and so forth. We celebrate Easter in the spring. And what happens in the spring? We have new life. Spring is a time when we, we have hope of what it's going to look like. In California now, we dream about how our lawns are going to be ever so brown. But it's, it's a spring. It's a new start. So I ask you this morning, what needs to be made new in your life? What do you need a restart over? You know, there are all kinds of stuff. Maybe it's your health. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's your finances. Whatever it is, Easter, Easter, the resurrection, says that is stronger than any problem that you have. That is more powerful to overcome anything, anything you're dealing with right now. All right, did you just gloss that over? Take a look at this. Your worst problem cannot stand up to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen for that? Do you believe that? Maybe. But you have these doubts. You have these disciples. You're going to see that tonight in the program. They had doubts. I don't know. I just don't know. I'm not, I'm not going to believe this. I don't know. You know, I'm really glad that the disciples had some doubts. You know why? Because it proves to me that doubt is not the opposite of faith. Doubt is a part of faith. It goes right along with it. What Jesus offers is a relationship, not a religion. You know what a religion is? It gives you a book of rules, a book of, a book of things to memorize and to agree to. Now, I'm not very good at memorizing. And I forget a lot of those things. And if you come up to me and you tell me your name, it's the first time meeting you, you know what I'm going to do right away? I'm going to forget your name. Why is that? Because I don't care? No. Because I just forget names. I forget creeds. I forget all these statements. I forget all the details of the Bible. But you know what I remember? The relationship I have with you. The conversation, the sharing of lives with one another. And that's what Jesus Christ offers to us not a religion of following a bunch of rules and that sort of thing. He offers to us a relationship. He says to us, follow me. Be in relationship to me. Wow. And I think what Jesus does to convince us, to show us who he really is, is... Try me. Just try me. Sometimes when people say to me, I don't believe in, in, in Jesus, I ask this question, which Jesus don't you believe in? Do you not believe in the judgmental, angry Jesus? Maybe that's what you picked up earlier in your life. Or maybe it's the boring Jesus the one represented by the aging, bald-headed guy up front boring you on a, on a beautiful morning? Or is it the consumer Christian Jesus who always seems to take care of your, your very needs until he doesn't? So which Jesus is it that you don't believe in? I believe in the God whose passionate love drove him to become one of us with all the pain that that included. And while he was here as one of us, he did things differently. He seemed to, to, to despise and yell at the people that we thought he would have liked, the religious leaders. And then he dines with and he takes in all these people that we would have thought that he didn't, we wouldn't have associated with. 
What? The tax collectors, the sinners, the prostitutes. He has all of that. So I believe Jesus does things differently. And he does things differently because he came to make everything new. So again, what is it that you need new in your life today? Remember spring. Now, God throughout Scripture has promised to remake the whole world and us. And Easter was the first example of that whole thing. That's why resurrection happened on the first day of the week. And God began creating on the first day of the week. So Jesus' resurrection was on the first day of the week when God began to recreate the world. And not even death could stop what he was doing. See, so see, I believe in the radical rebel Jesus who didn't come to make us nice, but to make us new. He didn't come to make us safe, but to make us dangerous to the devil. He didn't come to, you know, make us comfortable. He came to make us brave. I want to tell you a story I read recently from Kenya. This, this last week, Kenya had a horrible, horrible week when Christian students were, narrow, were zeroed, in, zeroed out for shooting by Muslim terrorists. They'd be asked, are you Christian? Yep, and they would be shot. Horrible. There's a positive story from Kenya. There was a woman named Jane, and she was very, very poor. She was abused as a child, so she fled and she ran. The only way she could make any kind of living, the only way she could stay alive was to sell her body. All she wanted was to put food on the table and get a two-room house. Not a three-bedroom, two-bath house, mind you. A two-room house, all right? Two-room. That she and her children could live in in dignity. So Jane met a few Christians, and they worked with a nonprofit organization, and they helped her think up a business idea. Everyone, everyone around her was selling mangoes and bananas and things like that. Well, she wanted to be different than them. She wanted something that she could market that would take her sales over and above that and get her off the streets and get her into that two-room house. So she prayed, and this group of Christians prayed together, God, open our eyes to see what we can do. What can we do differently? Now listen to this story. I hope your stomach is strong because this is, this, is, this is amazing. One day she saw a local butcher. He would chop the heads off of chickens and then throw them, as well as the innards, into this big pile. Okay, you with me yet? You grossed out yet? So she asked if she could take those. Okay, and what's she going to do with those? The butcher said, by all means, have them. She got a micro loan to buy some pans. She cooked up bunches of potatoes and onions along with the chicken innards for extra protein. You with me? And she threw in some onions there. Along with the chicken innards, she created this nutritious stew. Okay, you still with me? Not done yet. Now, this wouldn't work in our culture, of course. Understand this, so don't be taking notes. But it worked for her in Kenya. She then stuffed the chicken necks with this stew, sewed them up, and sold them as a meal that you could eat from the beak. I see that look on your face. You're impressed. I see some of you wrote that recipe down, and you're going to try it this afternoon, right? Do not invite me over to your house. I do not want to try that. But you know what they did in Kenya? Those things sold like hotcakes. They were a hot... Who would have thought those things would have been so popular? She eventually, her company grew to three employees, and then she was able to buy a modest two-room house. And when she walks into the house, she falls on her knees and she says, thank you, God. How does a woman like me ever get to be in a house like this? That was like a palace for her. 
from nothing, you have brought me something, she said to God. He makes us brave to change and do new things. And we just need to be open to the new things. And Jesus invites us to test him. I want to tell you a quick story as I, I close here about this past week that I had. I had outside my office three students came knocking on my, well, I came to the front office and I was in a meeting. And I got out of the meeting eventually and they came back and they knocked on my door. They were from Northern California. They were in their 20s. And they said, uh, we're here to uh, tell people the good news of Jesus Christ. We're with a mission group called YWAM. I don't know if any of you know YWAM. And so I was really curious and, and I said, well, how are you going to do it? What are you going to do? I, you know, well, you want to you wanna tail us? And I go, no, but I will have my cell phone on and you call me each time that you do something. So they said, well, we play a treasure hunt. This is what we do. Together, the three of us, we pray. And we have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And Jesus is going to direct us to someone to go talk to. Really? Okay. I'm impressed. Let's see what happens here. So they go away, and uh, they brought with them no provisions for spending the night. They um, had not much by way of provisions for food. They had no itinerary except to just walk and see where the Lord would lead them. One of them, the Lord would lead them to, would say something uh, that uh, someone was wearing such and such a coat. And they would run over to, I think it was to Safeway was one of them. And they, they saw a couple of gentlemen in the Safeway and they said, these are the two that we need to talk to. Now, I'm in Safeway. Nobody will even look at me, let alone get into a conversation with them. Oh, no. They asked them, can we pray for you? We're here uh, new in the area and we just want to pray for you. And doggone it, those people stopped and talked with these folks for a half an hour in, inside Safeway, telling them about Jesus Christ. And they were open. So then they sat on our lawn out here. And some woman was walking by, Middle Eastern costume on. And they pray. They had seen this person. They go up to the person and they say to her, they uh, say, can we pray for you? And the lady was, was Muslim, clearly Muslim, with the outfit that she had on. And she said, yes, I have a neck problem right here that's very sore. And so they prayed for her right there. Wow, okay. Is that crazy or what? Is that crazy? It is kind of crazy. But the neat thing about it is that they had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And Jesus wants to guide us and direct us and move us and speaks to us, speaks to you. It doesn't matter who you are and how many times you've been in church. He wants to speak to you. Jesus, you know how he proved himself to his disciples? He did not sit down with a whole fat book and say, now this proves that I am the Savior, blah, 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 blah. Oh, no, no. You know how he did it? He said, go and make disciples, baptizing in them in my name. He said, go. Who did he say go to? He said, go to doubting disciples. The way you experience Jesus Christ is by going in the name of Jesus, and doing it, and he will be there. Monica, if someone wants to sing in the choir, but they sit right there in, the, in their seat, are they going to be able to sing in a choir just by sitting there and not opening their mouth? The only way you're going to experience choir is if you stand up and sing. The only way you're going to experience God is if you get up and you say, I am going to go do something for Jesus Christ. Now, if you trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior this morning, you are eligible. If you're not, we'll get eligible right now. All you have to do is admit that you need a Savior, and that Savior is Jesus Christ. I am a sinner. God, I am so sorry for those sins that I have done. I want to change. 
On the back of your program is the plan of salvation. If you want to be a follower of Jesus Christ, there's a little sample prayer in there for you to pray. Come to Jesus Christ, invite him into your life, and then don't just sit there and then come back to church next year. Go out and tell somebody about Jesus Christ and see what God does in your life. He will. It's neat things. Stuff's going to happen.